Thank you, Dean. Uh, well, Council, we're, uh, we're anxious and ready to hear from you. We've, we've read uh, the written materials, and they're excellent. Uh, and so um, without any further ado, we will call on which of the Council for the Appellants will go first? Mr. Ezer? Well, good evening, Chief Justice and Justices. My name is Jacob Izard, and I'm joined by my co-counsel, Elizabeth Matheson. And together, we represent the appellant, Ms. Cindy Dixon. I will be addressing the first issue this evening, which is whether the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms applies to the residency requirement enacted under Article 11, Section 2 of the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation Constitution. As a preliminary matter, I'd just like to point out that the facts of this case are outlined on page 3 and 4 of the appellant's factum. Unless this honorable court would like me to recite the facts, I suggest that we proceed directly to argument. That's fine. Go ahead. I don't think there's any significant factual dispute. Thank you, Chief Justice. If there's only one thing that I want this honorable court to remember from my submissions this evening, it's that we can't lose sight of who the appellant is. Miss Cindy Dixon, a Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation citizen with an eager desire to contribute to her community in a positive manner by serving as a council member. When her nomination was rejected and when the respondent failed to engage in dispute resolution, Miss Dixon felt as though she did not matter as a Vuntut Gwich'in citizen. I therefore urge this honorable court to ensure that Ms. Dixon and all other vulnerable members of the Indigenous communities around Canada have the same access to the same rights, the same freedoms, and the same protections enshrined in the Charter as all other Canadians. <laughs> 
I offer the following as a brief roadmap for my argument this evening. I've broken the issue down into two separate branches. First, whether the charter should, sorry, whether the charter can apply as a matter of law to the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation Constitution. Under this branch, we'll look at section 32 and the case law surrounding its interpretation. And the second branch, whether the charter should apply to the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation Constitution. Under this branch, we'll look at the language of the self-government agreement, the language of the final agreement, and I'll address the policy concerns raised by the respondent. So let us begin then with section 32. Statutory interpretation principles in Canada are well established. Without going into detail on the mechanics of statutory interpretation, it suffice to say that the Supreme Court of Canada urges in Rizzo that we take a broad, purposive, contextual appro approach which takes into consideration the purpose of the act that we're looking at and the scheme of the act. What's the act you're referring to? Uh, the charter, sorry, Chief are Justice. There, are there not different rules that apply to charter interpretation than regular statutes? So I would suggest that um, although the the smaller details may change slightly. The generic approach for interpreting the charter is still, still requires a broad, purposive, uh, contextual analysis of the Constitution of Canada as a whole. But would you say that the, the reconciliation with First Nations and the Indigenous population is one of the factors that has to go into the interpretation of the charter? Yes, certainly, and that's a, that's a point that I will be addressing later in the policy arguments especially. I think that point comes to light very clearly in both the appellant's arguments and the respondent's arguments. So with that in mind, the purpose of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms is to protect citizens from government infringements on the rights and freedoms contained therein. Now the Charter can only accomplish this purpose if it constrains all forms of government action. Consequently, section 32 of the Charter appears to be more of an expression of the general principle of good governance in Canada rather than uh, a mere list that limits the Charter's scope. The Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples in Canada have repeatedly supported this notion. Also, the case law we see in Dolphin Delivery, we see in Eldridge, we see in McKinney, the Supreme Court of Canada consistently reiterates that the purpose of the Charter is to draw a distinction between private actors and government or state action. The courts of this nation have consistently found that the Charter applies to First Nation governments. Though the appellant concedes that most of the case law on the matter involves First Nations exercising their authority under delegation from the Indian Act, and the appellant clearly concedes that this is not the case here. The Vuntug Witch and First Nation is not acting under delegated authority or under the Indian Act. Nevertheless, the case law surrounding Section 32 remains sufficient to bring the Vuntug Witch and First Nation and its constitution under charter scrutiny. And it's not necessary to pinpoint the exact source of the respondent's power in order to conclude that the charter applies. Neither the trial judge nor the majority at the Yukon Court of Appeals sought to pinpoint the exact power, or the exact source of the power of the respondent. And that's because whether their source is an inherent Aboriginal right of self-government, or whether the source of their power is the self-government agreement, which is brought into effect by enacting legislation, the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation falls under the charter scope pursuant to the principles set out in Eldridge specifically under the first branch in the test that the Supreme Court of Canada established in Eldridge. Does, doesn't that sort of ignore the sui generis nation, nature of Indigenous first government, uh, in, Indigenous self-government? Because it's saying it looks like a government, it acts like a government, so therefore it must be covered by Section 32, whereas it's, it's something that's entirely different to anything we've, we've seen before in a Canadian legal tradition. I take your point, Justice. I would push back respectfully um, just on the, the fact that the issue here today is focused on 
the purpose of the charter being to restrain government action in a matter when it affects the rights and citizens of individuals. So what we have here is an individual, a member of the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation, who has been discriminated against by her government. And regardless of the sui generis nature of the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation, I think it's important that Canada's supreme law remains in force and in effect in order to provide Ms. Dixon and other vulnerable members of the Indigenous community with the protection that they deserve as Canadian citizens. Which is sort of like saying you can have self-government, but you have to do it within the limitations that we impose on you. So I take your point. I would suggest that there's a difference between the right of self-government and the exercise of self-government. So the right of self-government is established, it's affirmed, it's recognized in Section 35 of Canada's Constitution. And it's recognized in this honorable court this evening. But recognizing the right of self-government does not necessarily preclude limitations on the exercise of self-government. And that's what we're doing here this evening. The residency requirement enacted in the Constitution of the Van Tuk Gwich'in First Nation is an exercise of its self-government. By putting limits on the acts that they're performing, we're solely limiting the, the way that that right is carried out. We're not actually limiting the actual right of self-government. If I could draw an analogy, for instance, consider, let's say, something like the right to vote. The right to vote is recognized in Section 3 of the Charter. However, the exercise of the right to vote has natural limitations placed on it, say under the Canadian Election Act or the Nova Scotia Election, Elections Act. But I don't think that the Elections Act and the limitations that they put on the right to vote belittle this nation's uh, recognition or affirmation that Canadian citizens have a right to vote. Would you say then... Uh the recognition of the right to self-government is also contingent upon the exercise and without linking the two together, you no, know, it would make the exercise of the right meaningless without the, the full application of the right. I would push back a little bit on that justice based on the fact that, could I actually get you to repeat the question one more time? <clears throat> if the limp, wouldn't you say that the, the recognition of the right to self-government also includes the exercise of it? And without, if you were to limit it, then you possibly may be infringing upon the right itself. So I would disagree respectfully, Justice, based on the fact, and this is pointed out in the respondent's factum, they place a great deal of emphasis on the notion that reconciliation requires full acknowledgement and requires full appreciation of the right of Indigenous peoples to manage their own affairs. And while I do completely agree with that premise, I think the court can still fully recognize and, and, and fully acknowledge the right to self-government while still drawing a distinction by placing reasonable limits on that exercise. And I would suggest that the argument made by the respondents essentially fails to consider the importance of the rule of law in Canada, in that reconciliation should not entail unrestrained authority, but rather there should be room for reasonable limits to be placed on the exercise of that authority. Is there anything I can clarify further for you, Justice? So I'd like to turn our attention specifically to the language of 
the self-government agreement and the final agreement reached between Canada, the Yukon, and the Vuntuk Witch and First Nation. Uh, if you'd please turn with me to paragraph 43 of the appellant's factum, you'll find submissions, my submissions on, uh, on this point. So it's important to note that the final agreement and the self-government agreement are the result of approximately 20 years worth of meticulous negotiation between Canada, between the Yukon, and between the Vuntuk Witch and First Nation. So the language within those agreements is extremely important to analyze. We know that it is the, the words of those agreements were precise and they have a purpose within the, the particular agreement. So I want to turn your attention to section 24.1.2 of the final agreement, which states that the self-government agreement must be in conformity with the Constitution of Canada. Now, my friends submit at paragraph 35 of the respondent's factum that the purpose of that provision was solely to draw a defining line between the division of powers. It was to make sure that the final agreement, the self-government agreement, didn't affect what was listed in section 91 and 92 of the Constitution. However, I would suggest that that argument carries very little weight because the wording of the actual text of the agreement says conformity with the Constitution. It doesn't say conformity with section 91 and section 92 of the Constitution. It says conformity with the Constitution as a whole. And we know is, that is the it charter- Is say though that the, the it says that the final, uh, the final agreement says that the negotiated self-government agreement must be in conformity with the Charter. The agreement itself has to be in conformity with the Charter. It doesn't say that the, the, the First Nation government exercised under its inherent right to self-government, it must operate following the Canadian Charter of Rights. So I think it's very important to note that the premise of this issue deals with whether or not the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms can apply to the residency requirement, which was enacted in the Vuntuk Gwich and First Nation Constitution, and the authority to enact a constitution was specifically outlined in the self-government agreement. So we kind of have this hierarchy where the final agreement establishes what the self-government agreement had to entail, and then we have this self-government agreement which says, okay, under the self-government agreement, you can enact a constitution. So I would take it that if the self-government agreement has to be in, in conformity with the Constitution, so would the Von Tugwich and First Nation Constitution, which falls under the authority or under the scope of their self-government agreement. We can also turn to section 24.1.3 of the final agreement, which states that a negotiated self-government agreement shall not affect the rights of the Yukon Indian people as citizens of Canada and their entitlement to the services, the benefits, and the protections of all other Canadian citizens. So if Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation citizens cannot invoke the charter against their own government, I don't see how it could be said that they have the same access to all of the benefits, the rights, the freedoms, the protections as all other Canadian citizens. Canadian citizenship inevitably is inevitably compromised, sorry, when a distinct and sizable portion of the Canadian population is denied access to invoke the charter against the government that's responsible for carrying, carrying out the community's general welfare and the, the government that's responsible for good government in that territory. Council, earlier you said something to the effect, I'll paraphrase, that it doesn't matter what the authority of the self-governing uh, power is, whether it comes through the agreement uh, the final agreement uh, described in here, or whether it comes from the inherent right to self-government. But if it's the inherent right to self-government, then what do these provisions have to do with that? Because these seem to be directed to authority that derives from those agreements, uh, as opposed to something that's inherent. So I wonder whether, you, whether, we, whether we might actually have to come to a conclusion on the source of the, of the authority to self-govern, because the analysis as to whether the Charter applies seems to me may be very different. So, to your point, Chief Justice, I would direct you to page 11 of the appellant's factum. And the appellant actually does submit that the Von Tut Gwich'in First Nation derives its power from the federal legislation that enacts the self-government 
agreement and that enacts or brings into effect, sorry, the final agreement and the self-government agreement. So if the court is willing to accept that premise from the appellant, then it would follow that the wording of the final agreement and the self-government agreement then would have to be in conformity with, with the charter. Um, the argument that the precise language, or sorry, the argument that uh, the, the precise source of the Vuntuk Witch and First Nation power doesn't have to be defined is solely, uh, solely relates to whether or not we can place the Vuntuk Witch and First Nation under the first branch of Eldridge. We can do that whether or not it's defined, whether their source is defined as uh, an, an inherent right or, or through the self-government agreement. So is, is the position, is it your argument that all of the powers exercised by the... Um, Vuntun Gwich'in First Nation are all derived from federal legislation and that none of it um, is derived from inher its inherent rights? So or is there a possibility that some of its powers can be outside of the agreement? Certainly. I would suggest that the inherent right of self-government, which is recognized in Section 35 of the Constitution, that that right exists outside of the self-government agreement and that right exists outside of the final agreement. But what the self-government agreement in particular does is it demonstrates how the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation is authorized to carry out that right. So we're going back to that distinction between the right itself and the, the exercise of that right. So to a point that Justice Campbell made the, you're saying the charter applies to the manner in which it's implemented and, and carried out, so that to that extent there is an external limit placed on what can be done, even if it is inherent uh, self right to self-government. Yes, I would agree with that statement, Chief Justice, primarily because Aboriginal communities in Canada, even those that are operating under an inherent right of self-government, they're not externally sovereign nations. They, they, they are part of Canada, Canada sovereignty um, in general. It, it's, it's a shared sovereignty is how the, the Supreme Court of Canada has come to reconcile the authority of First Nations governments and of uh, the Canadian state as a whole. But is, is it fair to say we won't be able to achieve reconciliation until we start thinking about different ways to conceive sovereignty? To, co to, to, to coexist without the Canadian state Im impo essentially imposing Eurocentric values found in the Charter on people who don't necessarily accept those values. So to that point, I would suggest that first we, we must establish that the rights found in the Charter do not necessarily conflict with the rights of the Vuntuk Witch and First Nation. We see in Article 4, Section 7 of their Constitution that they have a very similar provision. If I may have 30 seconds to wrap up, I see that I'm out of time. Yes, sure. certainly. Thank you, Justices. Um, we see that in Section 4, uh, Sub 7 of the Vuntuk Witch and First Nation Constitution, almost the exact wording that's enshrined in the Charter, Section 15.1. So I would suggest that in particular, as far as it goes, um, in terms of the individual's right to be free from discrimination. Both the Vuntuk, Gwich'in First Nation and Canada share that uh, as a whole and they're not incompatible. So to conclude, I know I'm out of time. The appellant would respectfully submit that the Charter can apply as a matter of law and should apply to the Vuntuk, Gwich'in First Nation and its residency requirement enacted under Article 11, Section 2 of the Constitution of the Vuntuk, Gwich'in First Nation. Subject to any further questions, uh, those are my submissions. All right, thank you very much for your speech. Thank you, Justices. Whenever you're ready, Justices. Whenever you're ready, we're ready. <laughs> Good evening, Chief Justice, Justices. My name is Elizabeth Matheson, and I represent the appellant, Ms. Dixon, on the second issue of her appeal. Namely, whether the residency requirement in the VGFN Constitution 
violate Section 15.1 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Justices, this matter is about the importance of political participation for Indigenous citizens and condemning restrictions on such participation based on place of residence. As it stands right now, the VGFN Constitution requires anyone elected as chief or councillor to relocate to settlement lands within 14 days of election. The question for you this evening is whether this violates Section 15.1 of the Charter, and if it does, whether it can be upheld under Section 1. Now, at paragraph 41 of their factum, the respondent has conceded that Section 15.1 of the Charter has been violated. And therefore, if it pleases this honourable court, I would like to use my time this evening to proceed straight to argument on Section 1, as I think that this is the sort of the crux of the matter. However, I am also happy to canvass 15.1 if that's preferable to the court. Well, I think you're, you've correctly noted the concession by the respondent, so move to your Section 1 argument if any of the panel have questions about, because ultimately, whether they've conceded or not, uh, we still have to make sure we're satisfied that it is, in fact, a Section 15.1 violation. If we have any questions, we'll let you know, but proceed with your Section 1 argument. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief Justice. The test for justification under Section 1 is laid out by the Supreme Court of Canada in R versus Oaks. In order to justify the requirement, the respondent must prove that the objective is pressing and substantial, and that the means used to achieve the objective are proportionate. It is the appellant's position that the residency requirement cannot be justified under Section 1. I turn first to the objective of the residency requirement. With respect, the respondent has stated the objective far too broadly. The Supreme Court of Canada has repeatedly emphasized the preference for narrowly tailored objectives under the Section 1 analysis. In Thompson newspapers, the court held that it's desirable to state the purpose of the limiting provision as precisely and specifically as possible. This provides a clear framework for evaluating the objective's importance, as well as the means chosen to fulfill that objective. The respondent admits that the objective of the residency requirement is to ensure the well-being of VGFN citizens, and they state this at paragraph 66 of their factum. This is an incredibly broad objective, which, if accepted, loses focus on the specific issue at hand, which is political... Where, where do we look to determine the objective? How, how do we... How do we come up with, or how do you argue we should come up with the objective behind that particular regulation? Well, I would argue that the objective has to be stated specifically enough so that it is tailored to what the legislation and what, the, what is, it's actually targeting. So here, we're looking at political representation. So we sub, would submit that the objective is to ensure that the most immediate and direct connection, those with the most immediate and direct connection with the VGFN, are actually those who have the authority to make the decisions for the nation. So could it, could it be conceived of as something to prevent, for, for example, uh, if we acknowledge that more than half of the, the people in the, in the nation live outside the territory, and that uh, the bulk of the services are provided on the territory, that the purpose is to prevent a group of people who live outside the reserve from outside the, the territory, the, the treaty territory, from essentially governing those people who live on reserve. And I'm, I'm just, I'll ask as an example, you could have uh, a, a number of people who live in urban Ontario essentially becoming councillors of this First Nation and making the rules that apply to the resources that are provided to the people who live on reserve. Would that be a reasonable purpose for the legislation? Absolutely, Justice, and I would agree with you that those issues are pressing in this appeal. And I do address them at the rational connection and minimal impairment stage. But when it comes to the objective specifically, I think to say that the, well, the objective of this is to ensure the well-being of VGFN citizens, that really you know, almost answers the question to the objective inquiry to begin with, because who could possibly argue that that is not pressing and substantial? And also, I think it widens what is appropriate at the rational connection analysis for the specific issue that we're tackling, whereas the objective that the appellant puts forward, I think, is more tailored to the issue, and those pressing concerns can still be addressed, but in a more specific way. Now, the appellant submits that this objective that the appellant has put forward is pressing and substantial. 
because it honors the harmful impacts of colonialism and the goals of reconciliation. But what the appellant does not agree with is that the means used to address this objective are proportional. And I'll start with rational connection. The residency requirement is not rationally connected to this objective. Keeping outsiders out of VGFN politics is a worthy endeavor because as I said, it is in spirit of reconciliation and in recognition of the harms of colonialism. However, non-resident VGFN citizens are not outsiders to their community. The assumption that only resident members of the VGFM have a close enough connection to their community to govern is based on the stereotype that was rejected in Corbier, that non-resident members of indigenous communities are less capable of contributing to governance. This is not true. Non-resident members of indigenous communities have key concerns and considerations that their government you know, will figure out for them. Their co-owners... Council, isn't there, there evidence that there's a fairly high degree of mobility between people who live in the community and people who live elsewhere for a variety of reasons, including your client who lives where she does for a variety of reasons, including the health care needs of, of her son. So in the context of a community that strikes me as having a high degree of mobility amongst its members, what does residency mean? What does it mean when they say you must reside in the community? Well, I would suggest that the residency requirement is saying you need to be within the geographical bounds of settlement land, which would for, for most people be... But in. for what period of time? I guess I'm thinking we, we have, just to take it completely out of context, we have people that are residents of Canada for tax purposes that are here, you know, whatever it would be, you know, 180 days of the year. And the rest of the time they live in a different country, but they're residents of Canada. So is, is that sufficient? If your client were to have a, a home which she occupies half of the time, would that be sufficient under the residency requirement? I would argue that what the residency requirement is requiring as of right now is that while you sit in office, either as chief or as counselor, you need to permanently reside on settlement lands. And that is what the appellant is arguing okay. is inappropriate, given the considerations that we know about Indigenous residency and how that is a bit sui generis and how the residency decisions made by Indigenous folks are not the same as residency decisions made by non-Indigenous Canadians. It's a lot more complex and there are a lot more considerations that go into it, which is why I think in Corbiere, the Supreme Court of Canada recognized Aboriginal residents as an analogous ground in the first place because regular residence is not. And I think that the recognition there is why strict residency requirements like this are so difficult and why it can have the impact of excluding a lot of people. In, in Corbiere, they used the phrase ordinarily resident. Would that be applicable here? Um, and for, if so, how, if, if the First Nation were to use or your client were to use, how would that be uh, applied? So, do you mean if what would what would make my client ordinarily resident? Well, there's a lot of case law on the phrase ordinarily resident as defined under the Indian Act and was considered in Corbier. Um, to f come follow up on the point here, uh, what would constitute an ordinarily resident? I would argue for the purpose of the residence requirement as it currently stands, that would require Miss Dixon to live permanently in a residence in Old Crow or within settlement territory for the remainder or for the time that she serves on the council. Um, so as we pointed out a little bit in argument tonight is over half of VGFN citizens reside outside of Old Crow. And I think at the rational connection stage, it needs to be recognized that in reality, resident chiefs or councillors are not living day to day with the majority of the nation's population. And does that mean that resident citizens are unfit to govern because they don't um, live day to day with the majority of the population? Of course not. What the appellant submits is that it shouldn't be the other way around. Being able to contribute to your community isn't just about where you physically reside. It's about your knowledge of cultural traditions and your knowledge of your community. And that doesn't just disappear when you change your address. We also submit that the residency requirement is not minimally impairing. 
In this case, there are other less intrusive ways to further the objective of maintaining a government system with a close connection to the community. The VGFN could have instead limited the number of seats available on the council to non-resident members of the community. There could be a tiered system of governance, or perhaps there could be regulation enacted which specify what certain councillors can vote on depending on where they live. Now, I'm not speaking to the constitutionality of any of these requirements, but all I'm pointing out is that they are less restrictive than what we currently have, and they would achieve the same effect. Now, my friend appears to suggest that because the residency requirement allows non-residents to run for council or for chief, but they don't have to move until they're elected, that this makes the requirement minimally impairing. But I would argue that this ignores the values of substantive equality. The Supreme Court of Canada was quite clear in Fraser that at the heart of substantive equality is recognition that identical or neutral treatment can constitute severe inequality and what matters is if there's a disparate impact. And as was discussed in our factum, you know, albeit at the section 15-1 stage, the fact that non-residents are permitted to run but have to move if they're successful is really not much different than a complete ban on running at all. It's a distinction without difference. And my friend argues that the fact that these positions are paid somehow mitigates this impact at the minimal impairment stage. But I think that that ignores a lot of the other considerations that we've talked a bit about tonight that go into the decision of where to live. Um, other aspects of living in Old Crow have to be taken into consideration. A lack of access to medical care, employment, housing, um, higher education. All of these things could make living in Old Crow very unreasonable for a lot of people. Look at the appellant. She has a young son who needs ready access to a hospital. And it would be an impossible choice for her to make to have to sacrifice his health and his safety in order to take on a political role. And we submit that this isn't the sort of decision somebody should have to make to be able to participate in the government of their community. Finally, the appellant submits that the deleterious effects of the residency requirement upon non-resident citizens outweigh any salutary effects put forward by the respondent. My friend, with respect, downplays the negative outcomes the requirement produces, claiming at paragraph 81 that they are economic and social hardships not fundamental to section 15 rights. This is a significant understatement. Political participation has been found to be a fundamental exercise of citizenship. In the broad context, the Supreme Court of Canada has held that increased political participation enhances the quality of democracy. But political participation in, is particularly fundamental for non-resident Indigenous citizens. Indigenous councils make critically important decisions which affect all citizens, residents or not. Decisions regarding the use of community funds, allotment and surrender of land, and the availability of services. Non-residents have a stake in this game. And the residency requirement takes away the opportunity for them to put themselves into a position to help make these decisions. And what is more, the ability to meaningfully participate in community politics is key to sustaining a positive cultural identity. This has been found to be particularly important for Indigenous persons living in urban areas, such as the appellant, because cultural identity is tied so closely to land base and ancestral territory. Ms. Uh, Ms. Matheson, uh, yes. and correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're undoubtedly more familiar with the evidentiary record, um, but was there not evidence that historically, uh, through the, uh, uh, the, the historic way the community governed itself, pre-contact, pre-colonialism, uh, that residency of the leaders of the community in the community was crucial. Was, was there evidence to that effect? I would agree with you that there okay. was. And, and so what we're talking about now is really a modern manifestation of that historic uh, manner of governance. Does that change the analysis in terms of this weighing of the deleterious effect in the, and, and those sorts of things? Because the community historically has run itself in a certain way by saying, if you're going to be a leader, you need to be here. And now you're talking about changing that and saying, well, no, that's not that important anymore. It's what's more important is that people that are members of the broader community ought to be able to uh, participate in governance, even if they're not members, or not, sorry, not residents in, in Old Crow. Um, with respect, I would argue that while the connection to the land was noted in the evidentiary record as very important 
hmm. to government. That was not the only thing that was noted. It was also knowledge of the community, knowledge of customs and traditions, and connection to the people within the community. And I would suggest that in 2021, that is not something that can only be manifested through physically living on the territory. I mean, look at what we've gone through in the past year and a half. Uh, courts of law have been making fundamental decisions about people's lives over the phone or over Zoom for over a year now. And I think that that has taught us that you know physical location should not be a barrier um, that is too high to cross, particularly when other people's rights are at stake and those are the competing interests. And I would also note that uh, travel is an option. The appellant travels back and forth between Old Crow and Whitehorse, and there are flights into Old Crow. So I would say that when we're doing this balancing, we have to consider all of the options available to us now that can respect the, the connection to the land while also not diminishing people's cultural and community connections just because for some reason or another that they had to leave. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I understand your submission. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. I would argue that um, the ability to participate meaningfully in Indigenous government is key to sustaining a positive cultural identity. And that kind of goes to what we were just saying. Um, people living in urban areas need that connection and being involved in politics fosters that community belonging and sense of, sense of togetherness. Whereas this requirement disallows people from that meaningful participation. It, would that be the only method of community identity is through politics or is there any other ways that can, that can be achieved without uh, impacting upon the reasonableness of the, uh, the intent of the legislation? Well, I would certainly suggest that politics is not the only way that one can foster connection to their culture. But I will say when as I discussed the, the enormity of the decisions that are made by Indigenous councils. And I mean, I think that the, those decisions hit so much closer to home for Indigenous people than for people dealing, for, like for example, with the federal government of Canada. These are key things, surrender and allotment of land, services available to both on and non-residents and resident citizens. These are things that are going to touch your life. And I, I think being banned from participating that is a huge barrier between cultural connection when so many huge decisions that affect your community are being made through that medium. What this case really boils down to, justices, is maintaining the inherent dignity of non-resident BGFN citizens. The impugned residency requirement restricts meaningful political participation, and the appellant urges that this honorable court not let this stand. To do anything else would be to treat non-residents as other, as less worthy members of their community. This is not a desirable course of action, particularly given the incredible harm and stigma we know that non-resident indigenous folks already face in day-to-day -day life because of the decision to venture away from their settlement lands. And for these reasons, the appellant submits that this honorable court should not uphold the requirement under Section 1, and instead should use its power under Section 52 of the Constitution Act 1982 to declare the requirement of no, no um, force or effect. I wanted to leave time for questions because you mentioned you might have some, but bearing any further questions, those are the submissions of the appellant. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Matheson. I'll just ask my... Uh colleagues on the panel if they have any additional questions, particularly if there's anything in the, um, in the first part of your argument, the, uh, the violation or, of Section 15.1 that they want to ask. Uh, Justice Young, do you have any other questions? Not at this time. Thank you. Justice Campbell? Just very, very quickly, and it may not permit a quick answer, but um, issues of minimal impairment in that analysis. Can minimal impairment mean different things with different legislation? So that legislation that's drafted in this case by a, a, a government that's operating under its inherent right to self-government, that issues of minimal impairment should be looked at through that lens and given maybe more of a pass than a piece of legislation that comes from a municipal government. I would certainly agree with you that deference is key when there are Indigenous parties involved in law. But I would say that this constitutes a, um, a complete ban 
And I would say that when we get into complete, the territory of complete ban, um, there is jurisprudence which suggests that that's a dangerous area to venture. And so while I do think that deference is important, I also think that in this situation, um, and it, it would not be enough to save this under section one. Thank you, Justice. All right, thank you for your submissions. All right, I guess we're ready to hear from the respondents. I'll turn my chair. <laughs> Good evening, Justices. My name is Kelsey War, and along with my co-counsel, Nicola Hibbard, <clears throat> we are here representing the respondent, the Vintut Gushwin First Nation. This appeal is predominantly about the issues of reconciliation and the need to respect the right of self-determination of Indigenous communities. These, this has been a topic of serious discussion in the past several years in both the legal and government fields. And it is our position that this case now offers the court the opportunity to put those ideals into practice. The respondent submits that the Supreme Court of the Yukon erred in finding that the charter is applicable to their inherent self-governance. Um, they submit that not only is this contrary to both the intention and language of the charter, but it also infringes upon their right to self-determination and to manage their own affairs. To lay out a brief roadmap, this is based on key, three key arguments. The first of those is that the VGFN cannot be construed as government under section 32 sub 1 of the Charter. The second is that further language in sections 25 and 33 sub 1 preclude its application. And finally, true reconciliation requires the acknowledgement and recognition of the importance of self-determination for Indigenous communities. Moving first to the issue of section 32 sub 1, it is, the respondent must acknowledge before moving forward that as the appellant mentioned, the case law in this matter is not in their favor. All previous decisions have found that the charter is applicable to indigenous self-governments. However, it is the respondent's submission that these can be distinguished in two key ways. The first of these was already touched on by the appellant in that these cases involved the Indian Act, which is clearly not the case here. However, we would like to specifically restate that we are not relying on any form of legislation to recognize the VGFN's right to self-government. It is an inherent right flowing from their position as the original residents of the land, and thus is even more distinguished. Secondly, so, so what is the effect of the agreement then? What's the legal effect of that? Uh, because without that, what would the situation be? It is our position that the legal effect is to simply entrench that right into law and allow the Canadian government to recognize it exists, its existence. It is not conferring the power upon the VGFN. So recognition as opposed to conferring, that's the distinction you're making? Yes. Okay. So from a practical point of view, uh, VGFN residents are Canadian citizens with all the rights of Canadian citizens, I presume. That's, that's, that's a given. Yes. So they have the right to vote the right to freedom of religion, the right to assembly, all of those kinds of things. There's no, there's no issue there. No, no issue there. Okay. Do they get those from the charter or from somewhere else? We would submit that they get those from the charter in dealing with the Canadian and provincial government. And when they are dealing with their own government, it comes from the VGFN's constitution itself. Okay. So the VGFN could then have a constitution that says, um, for example, we've had a lot of trouble with the Catholic Church on our, on our and our land. Uh, they've not been friendly toward us, so we're going to ban any uh, religious observance that involves the Catholic Church. And you would say, well, yeah, that's their right. They can do that. In their constitution, they have stated that they see all people as equal in the eyes of the VGFN law, so I don't see an instance where that would fit within the laws that they have created for themselves. Okay, but that doesn't apply to residency, obviously. The residency is a different issue depending on political participation and as my co-counsel will outline, traditional connections to land and practical implications regarding distance. Okay. So uh, if I understand your argument, and I want to say it to make sure I do understand it, so I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, I'm not stating it correctly, then please by all means uh, correct me. Uh, your, your factum talks about dual jurisdiction or words to that effect. Uh, and I just want to, I think, in response to a question by Justice Campbell, uh, you indicated that the Charter would be available to 
members of the First Nation in relation to their dealings with, for example, the government of Canada. Yes. Uh, but not in relation to the dealings with their own government. No, we would submit that it is applicable to their interactions with other forms of government. As outlined, they still have all the rights available to other Canadian citizens. However, in dealing with the VGFN, as it is a unique situation involving an inherent right, we do not believe the Charter applies, and thus it would not be available to them in those very particular cases. So in the provisions of your client's constitution that are similar to some of the provisions of the Charter in terms of the equality provisions, not identical, but similar, you're saying that that's the First Nation adopting an equality right which is analogous to the Charter, but it's their own independent equality right. And so that's how you, you don't have to wrestle the, the differences between them because that only applies when they're dealing with their First Nation and the Charter language applies when they're dealing with other government. Is yes, that, that is what is we that would submit. Difference? Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, the second way that these cases can be distinguished, uh, just briefly, is they don't really go into any in-depth analysis of Section 32 sub 1. Um, when the Supreme Court did hear the case of Tepetot, which had questions on 32 um, at the appeal level, the Supreme Court stayed silent on the issue, so there's plenty of room for this Honorable Court to undertake a full Section 32 sub 1 analysis and come to a different conclusion than has been offered in the previous case law. We're also not governed by any precedent. Very true. <laughs> um, moving to that analysis of 32 sub 1, um, first, the definition of government within that section has been outlined with, by the Supreme Court in Dolphin Delivery to be a specific reference to the executive branch of the Canadian and provincial governments, and not a form of government more generally in the abstract sense of the word. Um, so there would, it would move to the tests outlined in McKinney and Eldridge, as outlined by the appellant, to have that discussion. Um, looking at the case of McKinney, in that case, the Supreme Court outlined what has been termed as the control test, which outlines three, sorry, five key factors that must be looked at to determine if an entity other than government can be subject to charter scrutiny. Those five criteria include statute, function, funding, control, and history. To look at those briefly, statute has already been discussed as the VGFN submit that they are not pulling their power from statute and it is an inherent right Therefore, there is not a level of statutory control over their right to self-governance. Would you say that, however, the, <clears throat> the final agreement it becomes a uh, modern self-government agreement protected under Section 35 of the Constitution? And wouldn't that rise to a constitutional instrument or statute of, of a higher nature? We would say it would but it would be more so between the dealings of the VGF and themselves and with the Canadian and provincial governments versus individual citizens in their interactions with the VGFN Council. Thank you. Um, moving to function, it is um, without argument in this um, case that the VGFN are serving a public function. They're acting as the government for their community and providing services. But as outlined, this is a non-determinative factor and may simply open certain decisions to judicial review, which the VGFN have provided for within their own constitution. Further on funding, um, again, is non-determinative, and the VGFN do receive funding from the federal and provincial governments. However, allocation, allocation sorry, is left open to them, and there are also issues of them uh, receiving taxes from their citizens to utilize and opening alternative revenue streams which could impact on those funding arrangements. Moving to the um, impact of control, that is the respondent's position that that's the key factor here. The government control that is seen in other cases is just not as present here as the VGFN explicitly recognized in the final agreement that they wish for the government to stay out of their affairs. When you say government control, you mean the federal government. Yes. In this case. And the federal and provincial government, well, yes. And provincial, but I think you're, it's primarily the federal government we're dealing with here. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, the language within it is simply making it very clear that the VGFN rebut any instance of government control and have made this arrangement in order to remove that level of control to the best of their ability. 
Um, moving to history, this is again a key factor in this case, as it is with any instance talking of indigenous governments and their interactions with the federal government previously. Like many other indigenous communities in history, the VGFN have been subject to extreme levels of control um, by the federal government, including instances of forced assimilation um, in residential schools, the loss of their land, and other forms of what can be termed as cultural and physical genocide. So history does play a key role. There has been a significant amount of control throughout history of the VGFN, but to rely on that to constitute them as a government today ignores the domineering non-consensual nature of those colonial systems and the VGFN would submit that it has no real place in this discussion regarding the specificity of indigenous governments. Moving to the cases of Eldridge and Gadbo, which were outlined by the appellant as being key cases that play a role in situating the VGFN as government. We would respectfully submit that the application of these cases ignores the underlying factor of the two um, decisions, which were that the charter is applicable as these are outlining duties that the government would normally undertake, and they are under direct government control by um, providing them. Can, can I bring you back for a, for a moment on, on the issue of government? Um, BGFN looks a lot like a government. It does a lot of the stuff that governments do. It elects people to it, um, whether they're resident or not, I suppose, is the issue. But if they're not a government, what would you call them? What, we, what word would you use to describe the entity that controls this territory if it's not a government? We would submit that government would be the correct word in the more general sense of the term, just not as it's considered within the charter. So looking at Eldridge and Gadbo, as I said, we were looking at cases of implementing specific statutory um, schemes um, or outlining delegated powers, which is not the case here, as the VGFN are operating under an inherent right as the original residents of the land to control their own affairs and manage their own day-to-day um, -day interactions with their people and the way that they wish to run their community and stay true to their cultural and legal traditions that they practiced pre-colonization and to the best of their ability throughout colonization. Um, with the permission of the court in the interest of time, I would like to skip over the arguments on section 25 and 33 sub 1 unless you have any questions. No, that's fine. We've read those submissions. Perfect. Moving to our final submission, um, it is the position of the respondent that true reconciliation requires that this court acknowledge and appreciate the importance of self-determination and recognize that the application of this charter in this case would constitute a limitation to that right. Um, this includes first looking at the importance of self-determination, which is an internationally recognized right under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People which has been accepted by Canada through Bill C-15 and its implementation plan to take all aspects of that declaration into effect. Important to upholding self-determination is not only allowing Indigenous people to make their own decisions, it is allowing them to use their own governance structures to make said decision. As was mentioned during the appellant's argument, restricting the exercise of this right is a restriction of the right itself. Meaning, if the VGFN are not able to use the structures that are known to them, they are not fully self-determining. This also includes the issue of consent. A key aspect of this is, during the Charter's creation, Indigenous people were not given a true opportunity to consent to its creation or implementation, and throughout the time since its passing, they have shown objections to its application to themselves, as it conflicts with their understandings of values and how rights work within their community. So what does that say about reconciliation? If we say it applies to Canadians and their interaction with their governments, municipal, provincial, and federal, the residents of the VGFN have a government, although we're putting finger quotes around it, it's a government that the Charter doesn't apply to. So what does that say about reconciliation when every other Canadian has the benefit of the Charter but the residents of the VGFN do not? 
Well, I would like to refer again to the fact that they still have the benefit of the charter in all the same interactions that other Canadian citizens have. But in their interaction with their government. Yes. It, for reconciliation, I think that's a very big question of what does that mean to restructure entire governments to take out what has been a key facet of Canadian law within the charter. And it becomes a question of what do Indigenous communities want to do when it comes to how they run their communities and what they wish to have applied. Um, it was referenced within the trial decision that the um, Nishka final agreement specifically references that they are subject to the charter, meaning that they made the decision in their negotiations to outline this fact, something the VGFN say that they isn't, specifically isn't didn't an argument, do. Isn't there an argument that the same thing happened here? Maybe not in quite that clear language, but the reference to the agreement being subject to the Canadian Constitution and that the residents continue to have the rights of Canadian citizens. Is there not an argument that that's in essence saying certain aspects of the Charter at least have been uh, adopted? It could be made an argument, but the respondent's position is, is that in saying that these um, legislations were made in conformity with the Constitution is first different from saying that they are bound by it, and saying that there are certain aspects of their agreement that do need to be bound by the Constitution in order to work. As I previously mentioned, there are funding um, arrangements between the federal and provincial government, which are specifically delegated to each level of power, meaning in that instance, the Constitution almost needs to apply for those governments to negotiate with each other on those matters. It does not necessarily mean that they intended for the Charter to then apply to their own government's decisions. Um, <clears throat> I just want to go back a little bit. And correct me if I'm wrong here, and um, in my reading of the Yukon Self-Government Agreement and the final agreement, um, there's a term contained in the agreement which defines that certainty. I don't know if you read that term, um, but uh, the term is intended that the, um, the inherent rights associated with communities in the Yukon Self-Government Agreement would hold their in exercise of their rights in abeyance during the duration of the agreement, in particular their inherent rights. So if this is the case, and again, I could be wrong in my reading of it, did the, um, did the one, two Quichin First Nation agree to hold their rights to uh, exercise their inherent rights, including the right of residency and membership under this larger agreement? It seems that they would have held their rights during the negotiation period so that things could be worked out to both parties' satisfaction as best as possible. But it didn't mean that they completely gave up that right once the agreement had been put into place and they'd started on the governance journey that they had intended from the beginning. Well, that was the whole purpose of the, the phrase certainty that allowed the negotiators to move away from the term extinguishment to allow negotiations to continue. But not to exercise them and hold them in abeyance, wouldn't that be the same as extinguishment? I would think that holding them in abeyance was just for the period on which negotiations were undertaken. And now that we are, I believe at this point, 17 years past the agreement, that abeyance would no longer be applicable. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so just to conclude, um, Sorry. Um, the respondent is requesting that this honorable court take the position that the VGFN's right to self-govern is vitally important to the preservation of their cultural and legal traditions, which have been irrevocably harmed by colonization throughout the time post-contact. In order to be able to maintain these traditions and to an extent revive them where possible, it is important that they be able to determine their own governance structures as best as they are able, and in order, and sorry, uh, applying the charter forcefully to this effect would face a limitation on their right to do so, um, meaning that they would be unable to repair many of those harms if they have to consistently then be held to the federal legislation that was such an issue when it was created. So it is for this reason that the respondent asked this court to find that the Charter does not and should not apply to the VGFN's acts of self-governance. 
If there are no further questions from the bench, this concludes the respondent submissions. Thank you. I think we I think we asked our questions as we went along. So thank you for your submissions. Thank you. Good evening, Chief Justice, Justices. My name is Nicola Hibbard, and I represent the respondent, the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation, on issue two. The question before the court is whether we should solidify our movement to a nation to nation relationship by respecting Indigenous peoples' powers over their own governance systems, or the, whether we should again usurp their inherent right to self government. When the Vuntad Gwich'in First Nation enacted the residency requirement, they were reviving their traditional law and political practices. To step in now would be to encroach on their inherent right to self-government and takes us a step back in the reconciliation process. As counsel for the Vuntad Gwich'in First Nation, our submissions are twofold. First, we submit that there are compelling reasons for this court to exercise deference in the Section 1 analysis. And second, we submit that the Section 1 analysis unequivocally supports a determination that the residency requirement should be upheld. Given that my friend... Who, who bears the burden on, on the Section 1 analysis? The Von Tuck and First Nation. Okay. We do. And how would you describe the burden? On a balance of probabilities. Okay. Right. Given that my friend has moved straight to Section 1, Unless there are questions about the Von Tut Gwich'in First Nation concession on Section 15, I would suggest moving to Section 1. That's fine. If we have any questions as we go, we'll, we'll certainly ask you. <laughs> For the benefit of the court, uh, the beginning of the first main submission is at paragraph 45, page 23 of the Respondent's Factum. There are four reasons why this court should exercise deference in the Section 1 analysis. The first of which is that it is necessary for reconciliation. The residency requirement is a revitalization of political traditions that were suppressed during colonization. Pre-contact, the Vuntuk Gwich Gwich'in First Nation was a political entity with a unique and sophisticated form of governance. Their leaders were selected based on connection with the land, knowledge of the land, um, and their commitment to, to community service. Decision making was undertaken within the community by discussion and deliberation. During colonization, Europeans took control of that power that the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation had over their self-government. They replaced chiefs with colonial church leaders, and the Vuntuk Gwich'in First Nation was not able to select a leader until the 1920s after that. The impacts of this manifest today through social, cultural, and economic disparities. Self-government addresses these by returning the power to the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation to enact solutions that are culturally responsive, local, and culturally relevant. The residency requirement is an act of self-government. It was passed by the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation in a constitutional amendment with which the appellant, Ms. Dixon, voted for herself. But it is also more than an act of self-government. So is the form of government in the First Nation now the same as it was pre-European contact, or is it in some way um, a compromise of modern values and traditional values to come up with something else? I'm just struggling with what, you know, when, when, when an agreement gets signed, who, who comes in and signs it? It's not, a, not an Indian Act banned, or is it? No, uh, Justice, it's not an Indian Act banned. So pre-contact, uh, the traditions were largely similar to what they are now. Uh, discussion and deliberation still take place for decision making uh, within settlement land in the community. Leaders are directly involved in service administration and service delivery. While it certainly looks different now, given that the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation government is responsible for um, education and housing and social welfare, it has modernized certainly, but the core elements 
of their government have not changed. Um, and while they are able to modernize um, and combine elements of their pre-contact traditions with modern uh, democratic traditions, the way they combine those are, are owed deference as well. You, you've used the term deference. I know you're going to go through uh, several reasons why we should give deference. But can you just give me a, a quick summary of how the principle of deference applies in the Section 1 analysis? If we agree with you that there should be deference to the First Nation in the decisions that they make. How does that play out when we're doing the Section 1 analysis? Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, throughout the second Section 1 analysis, the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation is asking that at each stage of the analysis, it is kept in mind that reconciliation is at the forefront of that analysis and the impact of what it would mean to uphold the residency requirement must be at the forefront as well. It would be incredibly important to Reconciliation and the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation to uphold the residency requirement, and Reconciliation and the well-being of the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation should be at the forefront. Practically, um, deference comes into play most at minimal impairment. My friend has given a list of alternatives that the Vuntut Gwich'in First Nation could implement. However, those are not in accordance with the Vantat Gwich'in's First Nations traditions. And so that is when the court should keep in mind the deference to political traditions for self-governing First Nations. Um, looking at the 14-day requirement as well, while it could appear short on its face, it must be kept in mind during that analysis that Old Crow is 800 kilometers from Whitehorse, and the Vantat Gwich'in First Nation has chosen this as the relevant time period, which would be suitable for them, as they are closest to the community and they understand what is needed there best. Moving to the second reason to show deference at the Section 1 analysis, for the benefit of the court, this is at paragraph 51, page 26 of the Respondent's Factum. The case law that my friend relies on can be given only little weight, if any, because of the different legal and social context under which the court was operating in these cases. When courts struck down residency requirements under the Indian Act, they were operating in a vastly different legal context. The power that bans have under the Indian Act is delegated power, meaning that the federal government gave them that power to enact certain uh, governments, uh, governance systems within the band. However, delegated power is not a tool of reconciliation because it fails to recognize the inherency of self-government. The court was therefore not undermining reconciliation when they chose to strike down that residency requirement in those cases. Further, case law on newly enacted residency requirements were offered. Sorry, counsel. So you're saying if the First Nation chooses to have a residency requirement, if they are exercising inherent authority under the right to self-govern, it's given deference. If they make exactly the same decision under the authority given them under the Indian Act, they don't get deference? We submit that while deference should be undertaken regardless when uh, residency requirements are coming forward, it is certainly less of a reason to give deference if it's enacted under the Indian Act because that does not, delegated power does not recognize the inherency of self-government. And when an indigenous government is enacting laws under their inherent self-government, those should be given deference given its importance in reconciliation. Okay. Case law on newly enacted residency requirements is also operating in a vastly different social context. When residency requirements are newly enacted, they are not a revitalization of political traditions, which is inherent, which is very important to self-government. There was simply not as pressing of a reason to exercise deference in those cases. Moving to the third reason why this court should show deference in the Section 1 analysis. This is at paragraph 53, page 27 of the Respondent's Factum. The third reason to show deference is the tension between individual rights and collective rights that is present in this case. The Charter is founded on a conception of individual rights, 
which necessarily puts the well-being of the individual above that of the collective. On the other hand, indigenous rights are collective rights. The Vantat Gwich'in First Nation has the inherent right to self-government by virtue of being uh, a First Nation. That collective right is fundamental to the well-being of the Vantat Gwich'in First Nation because it protects traditional territory, cultural and political traditions, and it results in successful development. That entire collective well-being is at risk when we apply the charter strictly in the case of an individual's and, and their rights. Moving to the fourth reason to exhibit deference, the honor of the crown is engaged in these circumstances. This is at paragraph 59 of the respondent's factum. The honor of the crown requires that the crown act with integrity in each and in every interaction with indigenous peoples. It's engaged in these circumstances because the Crown has made a constitutional promise to facilitate the ability of the Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation to exercise self-government in accordance with their tradition and on their terms. The self-government self agreement, which is protected under Section 5 of the Constitution Act 1982, is the source of this constitutional right. I would also point the justices to the language in the self-government agreement which references several times the Vantat Gwich'in's First, uh, First Nations' desire to maintain traditional decision-making structures. So how does the honor of the crown, I mean, I would typically see that issue come up when the crown is doing something that the First Nation takes issue with and says you're not behaving in a fashion that respects the honor of the crown. But here, the crown is not a party. Uh, are you suggesting that the court is somehow the crown and that the court needs to act with the honor of the crown? I am not suggesting that the court is the crown. However, I am suggesting that in these circumstances, when the court has a case before it where the honor of the crown is engaged, well, and the court- I thought the honor of the crown was engaged when the crown was a party, but they're not a party here. I think in these circumstances, given the, the unique nature of this appeal, that it is incumbent on the court to, to look at the context and whether their actions will impact the honor of the crown in Canada's constitutional promise to allow the Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation to exercise self-government in accordance with their traditions. If, if the honor of the crown also precedes a type of fiduciary obligations that's enacted, wouldn't the uh, Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation also be in a fiduciary obligation to its members? And wouldn't that also extend the honor of the crown, then becomes the honor of the Christian uh, First Nation? The honor of the crown, its source, comes from the crown's assertion of sovereignty in the face of indigenous people's existence on, uh, in Canada prior to that assertion of sovereignty. And it's attempting to reconcile those two very almost unreconcilable things. And so the honor of the crown applies specifically to the Crown, um, Canada, and the provinces. But um, no, Mr. Justice, we would uh, say that the honor of the Crown does not apply to the First Nation. Wouldn't the First Nation have some sort of fiduciary obligation or responsibility to its members? In these circumstances, arising from the honor of the Crown specifically, no, I do not believe that it would. Okay. So there, there are First Nations in Canada to whom the charter is now applied. We understand that. And what you'd be saying here is that in, in this, this case, the residency requirement should be allowed. So that would we not then have a distinction between First Nations people who live in um, Wakabot to whom the residency requirement, the, the charter applies, and the people in this treaty lands where we're saying no, the, the, um, the distinction is appropriate, that they're, they're, it's, it's appropriate to have a residency distinction, whereas in other First Nations we're, we're saying no, it's not because the charter applies. How does that reflect the honor of the crown if we're dealing with different First Nations people in such vastly disparate ways? 
that was a very poorly articulated question. I hope you can somehow find it in there. <laughs> I was going to ask you to repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I'm you. not even sure what the question was, so if you can come up with an answer, good for you. Thank you, Mr. Justice. I think that each residency requirement needs to be evaluated contextually within the First Nation that it operates. And I think um, I do an example of this um, in my factum when I mention um, Clark, um, the case of, of Clark. Um, and so in Clark, the residency requirement was up. Can, can you tell me where in the factum that is? I know yes. I read it, but just I'm trying to find that section. Yes, I'm just. Uh, so it's paragraph 76. Page 36. So in Clark, the residency requirement for the chief was upheld, but the residency requirement for the counselors were not upheld. And uh, in the this is in the minimal impairment analysis, so I'm jumping a little bit ahead. Um, but we submit that the residency requirement here is far closer um, than a total uh, than what my friend characterizes as a total ban. It's far closer to what is here in Clark, but Clark is admittedly uh, less strict than the residency requirement here because it allows. Uh, it does not allow the residency requirement for counselors. However, when we look at the circumstances of Clark, uh, Clark, uh, their, their reserve was located 25 minutes from Charlottetown uh, PEI. And here we have uh, Old Crow, which is located 800 kilometers north of Whitehorse. When we have counselors and the chief who are directly involved in delivering essential services to those citizens, where the only access they have is the, the Vantutkwich and First Nation government. And so the circumstances are much different there. The residency requirement in Clark was appropriate for the circumstances in Clark. And here, the residency requirement is appropriate, appropriate for the circumstances um, for Vantutkwich and First Nation. So would the residency requirement be dependent on the distance? Whether Would it matter whether it's like 100 meters or a thousand kilometers. So it is not entirely dependent on the distance. However, in this context, because Old Crow is 800 kilometers away and the, the chief and the counselors are directly involved in service administration, I think that is certainly a, a large factor to take into account when we look at why do counselors and the chief need to be residing in Old Crow. It's certainly a something to be given a lot of weight, um, whereas here, because those members of the band have access to um, the largest city in PEI, it is less of a factor to give weight to. Building off of the fact that there's 800 kilometers of distance from Old Crow to Whitehorse, my friend has said that physical location should not matter in 2021. However, this assumes that citizens in Old Crow have stable internet access, which the evidentiary record showed that they did not. It also assumes that they have access to computers and cell phones, um, which we do not know that they do. Citizens in Old Crow depend on the chief and the counselors for services daily. The chief and the counselor are responsible for interacting with citizens in the community and ensuring that their needs are met. This simply cannot be done from 800 kilometers away. We respectfully disagree with my friend that this requirement rests on stereotypes about those who live off reserve or off settlement land. It is simply based on the geographical and social realities of the Van Tukwish and First Nation that this is the only government that they have to turn to when they need things regularly. I would like to emphasize at the minimal impairment stage that Corbiere has never stood for the fact that there can be, that non-residents and residents must be treated the same. It only stands for the fact that when that, those systems do treat residents and non-residents differently, that non-residents must be able to exercise meaningful and effective participation. That is exactly what the Vantut Gwich'in First Nations 
governance system does. With the permission of the court, unless there are any further questions, I propose to move to the conclusion. Oh, go ahead. This appeal provides the opportunity to facilitate reconciliation by creating space for indigenous nations to exercise their inherent right to self-government. The residency requirement is the process by which the Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation exercise their self-government. It therefore has exceptional significance to the Vantuk Gwich'in First Nation and to reconciliation. If the court upholds this residency requirement, it will signal to indigenous nations in Canada that their inherent rights are respected and it will continue to rebuild the nation to nation relationship. We therefore ask this honorable court to uphold the residency requirement. Thank you very much uh, for your submissions. All right, so that, that concludes the submissions of the appellants and the respondents. The appellants do have, uh, if they wish, an opportunity for a brief reply. I understand it. Do you wish to take advantage of that? All right, you've said everything there is to say. All right, well, we appreciate very much your, your submissions. The panel will reserve for a few minutes and return with, uh, hopefully, with a decision. Has, has deliberated and considered the submissions, both the oral and written submissions of council. It was uh, a difficult decision, but we've reached a unanimous conclusion on the merits of the appeal, and, and Justice Young will give you a brief summary of our reasons for finding as we did. Good evening, everyone. Well, that's a big thing to tell. Well, that's a big thing to tell. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to be able to report on what we found. We did have a unanimous decision, and uh, we did note that both parties, both the appellant and the respondent, had some very good strengths, and they presented their arguments well. But we also noted that there were some weaknesses in how they presented their arguments too, and we noted those ones too. But overall, the strengths, you know, were very much more stronger than the weaknesses, right? You know, and I think our uh, we were a little uh, afraid of our questioning that we might have been a little too harsh and something like this. But sometimes you just want to jump in and say, "Okay, what about this? What about this?" Right? No, but we're not supposed to do that. Uh, <laughs> Well, we've uh, decided that, uh, you know, in favor of the, the respondent on the merits, and we've determined that the, the charter does not apply in this situation, you know. And if it did, it is, uh, it, you know, it is uh, saved by the analysis of Section 1. But we gave uh, strong, we were strongly persuaded by the difference argument that was made to the First Nations uh, uh, exercise of their self-government authority. And uh, that's our decision on the, the merits of the case. All right. Thank you very much, Justice Young. Um, now, uh, for the second part, maybe for some this is the most important part, but uh, we have the, the privilege, but a very tough decision, of deciding who the winners of the uh, Kitts Award and the Smith Shield are. Um, I should say the Kitts Award is the one I won when I was uh, a, a participant in the Smith Shield many years ago, so I have a great affinity for it. Uh, and things worked out pretty well for me having won that. So uh, I'll just say, say that comment, uh, and we will announce the, the winners of the Kitts Award first. Um, and, but before that, I, I think the consensus amongst the panel was the quality of advocacy was excellent across the board. Uh, you know, difficult questions, difficult issues. Uh, everybody was prepared. Everyone answered the questions, pushed back a little bit when they thought maybe <laughs> the question wasn't quite uh, on or they weren't prepared to accept the premise. And that's uh, 
uh, that's good. So obviously a lot of preparation went into it and, uh, and the results showed. So it was a difficult decision, but one that had to be made. So the, uh, the winners of the Kitts Award are Jacob Izzard and Nicola Hibbert. So congratulations to you two. As I say, I have an affinity with, uh, with both of you now. We, are, we share the same award. Um, so congratulations. But that means that the winners of the Smith Shield, who also did an excellent job, are Elizabeth Matheson and Kelsey War. So congratulations to the two of you. So. <laughs> So I guess that concludes the formal proceedings. Maybe we should close court and then we'll arrange for some pictures with council and the, and the bench. Court is adjourned. <laughs>